Hi. Hello. It's been a hot minute, hasn't it? In case you didn't know, I made an entire season of uh, my webcomic, Swords and Roses. So, I come back to you with more knowledge to share. I thought I would do just spitfire super fast tips and tricks that I have learned throughout making Swords and Roses for the past two years. Honestly, not planned at all. I have a plan. I threw it away because it seemed boring. So instead we're doing this. Some of these are pretty basic tips that you would know from like painting software, but they're really important anyway and super helped me. And others of them are brand new to the 2.0 release. So I thought we'll just put them all together into a smorgasbord of tips and tricks. Okay, so in the last post, I saw a lot of people talking about the vector brush in my previous video, which I will link to over there. There's a link. We'll go over it a little bit more in detail for you guys that want to understand a little bit more about how the vector brush is like so great. So what I normally do is I will start with like a sketchy brush. All right, so I have this super rough sketch of Alder that I want to ink. It's on a normal layer. So I'm gonna go ahead and lower the opacity with this little slider here, make a new layer, make sure it's the vector layer, you'll know by that little insignia, and start inking there. It's all there, isn't that special? So then the next thing that you do is you're gonna make a new layer underneath your vector layer, take your vector layer, put the little lighthouse mode on it, go to your fill tool, make sure that you set it to refer only to editing layer, I like to have mine cranked all the way to closing the gap because I leave gaps and then refer multiple turn on reference layer. And then what you do is have your handy dandy reference imported to your sub view, which again, you should watch that video I made because it'll show you how to do that. And then you just, uh, you just tap and you can easily fill tool your entire thing. Boop. Boop, ba -doop, ba -doop. And that's how fast I literally paint all of Swords and Roses. And I know I sped it up for you in the video, but like, it still took me like no time at all. <laughs> that's why you should use the vector tool because one, it makes inking go super fast because you can use the vector eraser tool. And then the next thing is that you can use it, even though you can't flat on it, you can flat on a layer beneath it, which is honestly better for coloring anyway. So win-win in my book. Other weird tips and tricks you might not know about. So if you use Clip Studio to make speech bubbles, which is this speech bubble icon, you can set it to always have the correct line color and fill color. So automatically it's going to be set to main color and secondary color as your line and fill, which means you have to constantly keep changing your colors down here. For example, when you first come in here, it'll do this. And my bubble is going to be black lines with the orange center because I have black and orange as my two colors down in here. But if you set it to user color and user color, in order to change these user colors, if yours are weird, select the color that you want and then just click on it and it'll fill it. So now, no matter what my like crazy colors are down here, if I have like, I don't know, like blue and red and I make a speech bubble, it's always gonna be black and white and I never have to worry about color changing it. The other thing that I highly recommend is you can do the same thing with your text tool. You go in here, change all your settings to your text tool. Like my default font size is always 14. And then the font that I use, you can change your text color again to be user input. So it always locks it to be black or white, whatever color that you use. And then what you want to do is come down the little cog, cog wheel. It's not a cog wheel, it's a wrench. Use the little wrench icon, it'll give you this pop-up. You save, save all settings to default. It'll always be correct with the right colors and everything. The next thing that is pretty cool is that you can use multiple versions of the wand tool. If you have the wand set to refer to editing layer only, if I have my flat color selected, then I can choose that color by tapping on it. But notice that it won't pick up other colors that are the same color that are not connected. If I wanted to be able to tap the top of his head and it grab this back hair as well, like the back ponytail, apply to connected pixels only is basically what does that. So if I turn that off and then click it, notice that it'll select the back of his ponytail and the top of his head. So you can toggle that on and off. The other thing that I think is really handy though, is if you want to, let's say have a layer on top of your flats, and set this to multiply. 
and then you want to paint on the multiply layer and not actually touch your flats. So what you can use is selection for referred layers. Then you come in here after you finish flatting, you set the little lighthouse to this guy. And then when you go into your multiply layer, it's using the selection of the normal flat layer without me actually being in the flat layer. I don't have to toggle back and forth in layers is basically what I'm saying. Use that a lot, honestly. Oh, another random thing that I found super duper handy. Let's say that this is my Webtoons page and I'm doing layout. What I used to do before is like take a brush and like make and draw really terrible panels and go through that way. And then I would have to like draw selection boxes around them to like move them around and stuff like that. No, 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 your girl don't do that no more. And you're not gonna do it no more either because I'm gonna teach you how to do it faster. In the video that again, I'm linking over here, you should really go and watch that if you haven't already. And if you haven't already, you should finish watching this one first because watch time. <laughs> I don't even get paid for these videos. Who am I kidding? What you should do is you should make yourself asset materials for all of the different panel types that you use. Spoiler, Swords and Roses only uses five different types of panels. Create like a rectangle. Let's say this is the panel that I wanna create. Fill it with black. Shrink the selected area by like, I don't know, five or 10. And then you're gonna clear it using that. So that way we made a square, right? And then you can save this as an asset like I showed you in that video, just like you save the assets of your character's face turnarounds. Once you create all of these assets in your library, when you're doing your layout, you can just click and drag them into your scene. And you never have to draw crappy boxes again. They're all nice boxes that you can actually like use pretend with me that I'm making a webtoon. So those are all on my panels. What I can do then once I have them all in position and I like where they're at and I, you know, I'm happy with it. I can select all of these layers, right click and then go merge selected layers. Now they're all on one layer and I can simply use the fill tool. And uh, I don't know if you have black backgrounds or white backgrounds, but there you go. Your layout is done. <laughs> And it took like a quarter of the time that it normally does. Highly recommend make assets of all of your panel sizes and then just throw them out there willy nilly. So that way you get a good layout and like no effort. <laughs> For the illustrators that are in the chat, I see you, you're in here. Create a asset for your signature and then you can just drag and drop it into your illustrations and you never have to sign anything ever again. And it always looks nice. You don't have to hope that your signature doesn't look crappy because you redid it and you're tired and you've painted this for 12 hours straight. You can just stamp that puppy right in there. Let's talk about masking really quick. I feel like this is something that is this hidden world that people don't use. And then I talk to them and I'm like, why are you doing it this way? Like that takes 20 times longer. And then I realized from talking to them that they don't actually know the power of masking. You guys have probably heard using the clipping mask, right? That's a pretty standard one, which is this little guy here. If you click that, when I color outside of the area that's like the flats, it'll automatically like clip it to the flats. But let's say I wanna clip inside the clip. And by that, I mean, I want it to stay inside the flats, but I don't want it to interact with his horns. I just want it to be inside of the hair. Well, you could say, okay, well, I can just use the magic wand tool every single time. Every single time? Well, I don't have time for that. Is we use the magic wand tool the first time. For example, I'm using his hair and we're gonna create a mask inside the clipping mask. Again, this is like, we're going the matrix mode now. By the way, you can edit the mask by just clicking in here and then like painting. White is things that'll be seen through and black is like masked out. That's what the white and black is. But if I toggle over to this one, which is like the active painting zone, now I can paint in only his hair and I can leave this layer and come back to this layer and it'll still always be locked to his hair. I could label that or Let's be honest, nobody labels any layers ever, but I could at least color coordinate it to be red so that way I'd know it was his red hair. And then I can make 27 different layers and not have to worry about magic wanding every single time I inevitably come back to his hair because it's just locked. Masks inside of masks, inside of masks? You're probably like, wait, maskception, you've lost me. Let's say, 
I want to be able to mask both of these clouds under the same mask, but then I want to be able to control each set of clouds as well. So I want to be able to control them as a group of both the clouds, but then inside of each group, I want to be able to control just the white clouds and then just the blue clouds. You're going to take both of these together and you're going to put them in a folder. If you notice that it does this and it looks dumb, it's because the multiply layer isn't affecting it anymore because it's in a folder. In order to fix that, you come up here and just click through and then it'll apply all of those modes correctly. So that's how you fix that if you ran into that before. And then what I can do is I can make a mask. So now both of the clouds are within that mask together. So if I turn this off, right, they're both masked in there. But then if I want a separate mask on top, what I can do is I could grab these set of clouds and I could mask each of these individually. And now there's a mask actually controlling each of these. So if I come in here and I erase on the white cloud mask, notice that it only affects the white cloud, even though it's in a, cause it's in a mask stack where if I wanted to instead erase both the white and the blue clouds, I would go up to this mask here and then erase. So each of them is on a mask, right? So if I just want to erase just the white clouds, I'll have the mask selected, grab my eraser tool, and then I will erase. And it'll erase the clouds, but not really. It's just erasing the mask. But if I want to go through and I want to erase both the blue and the white clouds, I go to the top mask stack and then erase, and then it'll take them both out. Mask stacks. And the nice thing about them is like, okay, why not just erase normally? Well, if I erase these clouds, and then I come back to the illustration later and I'm like, man, I really want to paint those clouds back in. Well, I'd be doomed. I'd have to redo the entire cloud layer just because I erased them. But if I'm instead erasing a mask instead of the actual content, then you can go in here with a brush and just paint back in the clouds because you're painting on the mask, not the actual layer itself. Non-destructive workflows save you so much time. There you go. Stack them masks. They're great. Key commands, which are really handy to know. If you don't know key commands, I'm gonna teach you some key commands. So if you wanna change or look at your key commands, you come up to file and then you go to shortcut settings. You can set all of the shortcuts inside of Clip Studio. So if you use Psy and you know all of those shortcuts, they're not the same in Clip Studio, you can change them in here. But you'll notice in my tools that I have the B key set to two separate pieces. So does that mean they override each other? No. The cool thing with brushes, like pens, pencils, airbrush, all of that sort of stuff, put them on the same key. What'll happen is it'll just toggle through all of the ones that have that key set. Use my brush, right? And then not have to like leave and go digging for it. I can just click the B key again and have it set to my blur tool. And then I can just immediately like blur and then go back to like my brush and then just click the B key again and blur and just toggle one button back and forth and it lets me toggle like two separate zones. Okay, another cool shortcut you could you should know is if you hold down the control key and you click on the actual like icon, it'll select everything within that layer. If you hold down shift and control, it will add to that selection. So if I shift control the outline, notice that it'll now grab them both together where if I just hold down control, it'll toggle between the two of them. If I hold down shift at the same time, it'll add them together. If you are resizing something, edit transformation properties. I, control T is how you get to these, by the way. So that's another shortcut that you should use. So if you hold down the alt key, you'll notice that the little arrow goes from these scale arrows to the little white arrow. And that's how you can like bend images. Yeah, Control, Alt, and Shift are all crazy handy. Also, if you guys don't have a shortcut button, I am not sponsored. I'm not even paid to make these videos, okay? If you have a holiday coming up and there's a request that you could ask of someone, there's a bunch of different control keys like this. This is the Wacom one that goes with my Cintiq, but you can pick whichever ones that you want. But the great thing about this is that you can program all of these buttons to not only be buttons of your keyboard, but also key commands. Like for example, I have one button that's copy, control C, and then one button that's paste, control V. Really handy, I highly recommend it. It's super sped up my workflow process and um, yeah, just something I'm throwing out there. So version two made an update with the 3D assets. If you go into the 3D, 
area for materials and there you'll notice that there's a head section and you'll see that there's a head here. You can click it and drag it in. We now get a whole bunch of different properties that we can manipulate with this head. So the one that we're gonna focus on first is called facial features. Click the little plus button and you'll notice all of these features. Basically it works the same as the body if you've ever edited the bodies before. You click a zone and you can change the height and the width of that zone. Or if there's like the eyes, there's like a bunch of different sections. You can like move the eyes, like rotate them around the head. You can slant them up or down, all sorts of fun things. The other cool option that you're gonna wanna look at is face mixer. Basically they have all of these presets in here. And if there's a preset that you like, let's say I want my face to look more bebe. I can click on it and you'll see the scroll wheel. And basically what it means is how much do you want what you currently have, which is 100%, so like this is affecting it 0%, which is why it says zero. How much do you want this new baby head to affect the settings and the edit that you just did? And the baby head, to get all the way to that baby head, you just scroll it all the way up to it's 100 and then it exact duplicate copies. You can do multiple at once as well. Baby chonky boy. You can create disasters like this. <laughs> I don't know why they didn't just add it to the bodies though. So the full body is still the same, just with the blank face. So this is a separate asset that you have to put on top of it, which is strange, right? Like why didn't you just put this all in one where the body is editable and the face? Because they didn't want to redo the controls in the mesh. I get it, but still kind of poopy. I think that's pretty much going to wrap it up for me, guys. I hope that was helpful. If there are certain tips that you guys would like to hear about, you know, put it in the comments below. I read them all. I'm going to try and make another video here soon as well. So subscribe if you haven't already, because that's going to be on the way. How do I sign off again? Oh yeah. Be your own biggest fan. That's what it is. Stay cool, guys. Peace.